I think we have everybody in their places. So, we've had a, uh, an exciting uh, morning, I think. I've had a lot of uh, comments on, on what, a, what a remarkable group of speakers we had. Uh, Secretary setting the tone for us. Um, Don Snyder uh, getting us thinking about who we are as members of a profession and what it means to be part of a profession. And then Simon Sinek really getting into this whole thing of, of, um, of leadership and, and thinking about leadership in a different way. And General Perkins being here to talk to us about what it looks like from the uh, profession of arms looking at the rest of the profession and what we can be thinking about and what we can be doing. So we appreciate all of this morning's speakers. And I know that uh, the General Brown is, um, I won't say he's upset with me, but, you know, he said, gee, you really set me up for success here this afternoon, didn't you? Having, you know, four really great speakers in the afternoon, and now I've got to come after everybody's had lunch, and everybody's ready to go on and do other things. Uh, what are you doing to me, Carl? Well, I told you I get you. <laughs> no, ser seriously. Uh, General Brown has, has been a great partner on the, the Human Dimension Council and the work that the Army's doing to talk about what kind of soldiers we want in our Army, what kind of people we want in our Army as we look forward to Force 2025 and beyond. Um, he is uh, an Academy graduate. He served at every level up to Corps. His last assignment before he went out to CAC was, and I won't say I Corps, I will give it his proper name, it was First Corps. Um, and has been a, a, a great warrior, but also a great thinker and about how to teach people, because he has a master's in instructional technology, I think, from the University of Virginia. Uh, so he's, um, he's both been an operator, but he's also been a trainer and think about what it is we need to do to do a better job of, of creating that human capital that we need to run the Army. Because at the end of the day, as General Abrams said, the Army is people, and, and that's what we're all about. So without further ado, let me introduce Lieutenant General Bob Brown from CAC. Sir. Thanks, Carl. Thanks. Well, you, you know, uh, Mission Command at its best, empowering the Center for the Army Profession and Ethic. They work for me. But I guess there's a little catch to Mission Command. You empower them, and then they put you on after lunch and after <laughs> Simon Sinek. i got to work on that. Maybe not so much empowerment. But, uh, you know, uh, first thing I wanted to do is... Uh, is thank you all for your service. Uh, there are a bunch of people sitting out here. I can guarantee I would not be standing here uh, had I not worked with them uh, as a much younger officer, uh, younger leader, and, and they, uh, they're really amazing. And, and I don't think we say thank you to you all enough. You know, we get thanked in airports, That's, but when you're old, it's always uncomfortable as hell. You know, the, <laughs> I tell them I'm just thankful to still be breathing, let alone serving. But, uh, but, uh, you know, we don't, you, you don't get thanked walking to an airport, but we, we, we could not do what we do as an army. We couldn't be the best, we would not be the best army in the world if you all weren't uh, sitting out there. And from Kirby Brown today, who uh, does amazing work for me, he's my deputy out at CAC, to I could name about 20 other folks in here throughout the year. So thanks for what you do. Uh, it's a real honor to talk to you today, and it's a real honor to serve with you uh, as uh, army professionals. So uh, I feel really good. And I get to talk about the uh, army ethic. And... Uh, the importance of an ethic. Always tough to follow Don Snyder. He's, he's fantastic. And I'll, I'll cover in one of the slides a part. I was listening to him and kind of, uh, you know, when, when we uh, were discussing earlier and I thought, you know, I think I know about this ethic. And, uh, you know, it's important. Of course it's important. But, you know, when I really listened to what Don said and dug into it and it really hit home, the caught, not taught, or caught and you uh, from being taught. Uh, that, that it's in here, and I started to look at incidents where folks got in trouble, uh, and clearly they were uh, just uh, rules-based and uh, were able to break a rule as opposed to it was part of their uh, values, it was part of their, their uh, culture, their, their, uh, their ethic, if you will, uh, and they wouldn't break the rules. And, and uh, so I really uh, thank Don, it's amazing and a real treasure that we have to help us uh, throughout the Army uh, with this. So I had the uh, CAPE guys, I did have them research like crazy, find me a good ethic, not a boring one like a lawyer ethic or a doctor's ethic or code, that's kind of boring, but a good one. So we found this one with all the research, go ahead, next slide, the cowboy ethic. All right, and to give you a minute to look at that, it's, 
This was really Gene Autry's ethic. I got to say that up front. Uh, but I put John Wayne on there because he just looks cooler than Gene Autry. No, <laughs> no offense to Gene Autry, but uh, John Wayne, come on, the Duke, how can you go wrong? And it's a little dated, but it's pretty, it's pretty good. You look at a cowboy ethic, you know, do the right thing. So uh, I'll go through a little bit of uh, the, the uh, go ahead to the next slide if you would, and sort of build through. So folks come in to join the Army profession, either as a soldier or as a civilian. But they come in as individuals. And they become army professionals, like the day they, they say their oath, all of a sudden they're army, well, you know, of course there's different phases and so forth. And what's interesting when you look at it, we're expecting them right from day one to live and uphold the army ethic, but they're, again, varying levels. And they come in, if you look at the top of that chart, is where we want them to be, as ethical army professionals. Uh, but everyone comes in at a different level. So go ahead and build. And so what we're always trying to do, we've got to educate, train, uh, to get them uh, closer towards what we would consider an acceptable ethic. And of course, everyone has, a, there's a gap there that we have to fill. And I've always thought it'd be interesting if you could take a formation of soldiers or take this formation right here and put like a picture of you standing there and then behind you kind of where you came from. Because we all, as we're working together every day, we're like all on the same team and we seem the same, but if you could look at the variety from Wisconsin to South Carolina, from you know all over our society, and yet we come together pretty quickly, uh, and, and again, uh, that, that desire to serve something greater than ourselves, and we're part of this profession, but closing that gap is the part that we've got to work on, and quite honestly, I think we have uh, many times, we've just assumed folks are going to get it in basic training. They're going to get it in their first few years in a job as a, as a civilian. They're going to get it. They're going to be mentored. They're going to get it. Uh, but everybody is a little bit different. You know, one size does not fit all. So it's something we have to continually work at. Uh, we, we can't assume they have it. And throughout the process, from when you come in all the way up, uh, really, uh, as a senior leader, it, it changes. Uh, and you all know that very well. There are different things, different rules that uh, apply and different temptations and, you know, you went from when you first started, you didn't have much power, and all of a sudden you have a lot of power in your area. And so how do we close that gap and make sure we're, we're developing these professionals? Go ahead and next slide. So uh, a key part of that, of course, is uh, character, competence, and commitment are a key part of the profession. Uh, they, are, they are not, uh, you know, what we want them is exactly as you see there, the same. Sometimes I think what happens, I know what happened for the armed uh, the the uh, military side of the profession, we put a little bit too much into competence and not enough into character. Uh, you're a very competent individual, and you can sort of, people will maybe sometimes overlook a character flaw because they really are just so incredibly competent, uh, and, uh, and that, that, can be, that can be troubling. So they have to stay in balance. And they, what it leads to when you demonstrate that character, competence, and commitment 24-7, by the way, this is another challenge, uh, not for most of us in here, but I, all the younger officers coming in, uh, it's an issue of they have a separate world in many cases in the Internet, uh, no different for civilians coming in. And so some of them, when you're, when you're discussing this 24-7 character competence and commitment, they will kind of, uh, you know, they have more temptations at their fingertips than ever before in history, and they can go and do lots of things that are not what we want of a professional, but they sort of view it, their mindset is, this is okay because it's at home, it's away, and uh, as we all know sitting here, it's, it's not okay. But how do you teach them, how do you train them, how do you close that gap so they understand that? Uh, and of course, that leads to trust, the character, competence, and commitment. We know 24-7 we're professionals, and that leads to a trust which uh, I'm sure General Perkins commented on, for us, trust is the bedrock of the profession. Uh, for all of us in here, it's the bedrock of the profession. When we use, you know, mission command is all about trust. Without trust, you can't execute mission command. And I would argue today, without mission command, you can't accomplish your mission uh, in all of our uh, jobs, you know, because there's so much, you know, the fog of war, uh, be that in the Pentagon or on the battlefield, the fog of war when we were younger, was not enough information, you know, and so there just wasn't enough. It was a little bit easier to have initiative because you could say, let's go the old do something, do anything, lieutenant, you used to hear. Uh, nobody was going to critique you because you only got a couple bits of information. What's the fog of war today? 
too much information. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, we're all overwhelmed. And so the fog of war today, it's a little tougher to have initiatives, a little tougher to demonstrate the character, competence, and commitment, keep it in balance because you are overwhelmed with information and you're looking for the golden nuggets that help you make a decision. Uh, but you are overwhelmed uh, with those. Uh, and so what are the systems? And if you can't empower, you can't do it all. We all know that. I mean, uh, I usually use the example. I get rid of them because I'm mic'd up here. But I carry an iPhone and a BlackBerry, something I said I'd never do. But if I want to communicate with my three daughters and my wife, I have to have the darn iPhone <laughs> and, uh, you know, on Instagram and all that stuff. Uh, who has time for that when you get 150 emails a day? Uh, but what's important is, uh, as we all know, you know, it, you cannot do it all. I, and not that you ever could, but certainly when you had less information and it was more about command and control, you could uh, be a little more uh, of a draconian in your guidance, a little more of a micromanager, no doubt about it. Now you can't, you have to empower. But if there's no trust, you can't empower. So how do we build that? Of course, character, competence, commitment, the Army ethic is around all of that as a key part of that. Uh, and the problem in the past has been we haven't articulated the Army ethic well. Don covered how it's, it's in traditional documents. We have it in creeds. We have, it in, oh, we have bits and pieces of an ethic. But what we're missing is a well-articulated, clearly understood ethic that can spread throughout uh, the organization and uh, be a guide to help us build, go ahead and build the slide, to help us build that trust. Because as you educate, train, and have the right experience as part of the Army ethic, uh, go ahead and build again. That trust will grow uh, as, within character, competence, and commitment. And if, we, if any part of that's not balanced, it's not going to grow. Okay, next slide. So we look at, uh, for the first time, ADRP1, uh, June 2013, the Army's birthday, first time ever in doctrine we actually came out and the whole ADRP was about the, the Army profession. And uh, that articulated very well what a professional is. It talked about being a professional. It touched around the Army ethic extensively. Again, I know as Don talked about. Uh, but it did not, at that time, articulate a well-defined, clearly understood Army ethic, partly because uh, it's not easy. And we're going to need your help uh, you're going to break out in small groups after this and go over the Army ethic that has been developed. It's still in draft, uh, and it's been looked at. I'll show you in a little bit. It's looked at by a lot of folks. But I think the key part I want to touch on here, see if this pointer works. This is what I was talking about. Uh, for me, this is what really resonated. There's legal foundations, and People will break rules if it's just strictly rules-based. You have to have them. I'm not saying encouraging people to break rules. I'm just saying I'll show you an example at the end of a rules-based organization that went very wrong because they will find ways. It's just our nature has been for a long time, and I'm sure Don explained it a heck of a lot better. They will break those rules. The, the moral foundation, now over here you get a little bit more, again, at the, uh, those creeds, the values that become internal and you work on. I remember uh, when I was commanding Fort Benning, and uh, we start from day one with the soldiers uh, in basic training. We had 12,000 soldiers a day in basic training there. And uh, they do this obstacle course uh, in the first week. And uh, it was a pretty, pretty good job by the drill sergeants. They go through the obstacle course uh, in, in mass. And then each platoon, you would think, would pick the, the best person to go against the other platoon in a competition. What they do is they pick the folks who finish last. Uh, and so they go against each other in a competition. And General Retired Sullivan happened to be down there visiting that day. And we're watching all this. And none of it was scripted. I wish it would have been brilliant had I scripted the whole thing. But it was all just we're out there watching. And so the last member of each platoon now is going to go through the obstacle course again. And of course, uh, they were struggling. They were you know, in the mud and you know, just. and so spontaneously, it was really amazing, the, the platoons that were back in formation while the individuals were out on the course in front of them, they, they said to their drill sergeants, I had the courage to say to their drill sergeants, can we go out and support our teammates on their own? The drill sergeants didn't say get out there. They said, can we go support our teammates? And the drill sergeants said, yeah, get out there. So they ran out there. And then what did they start? The Army values. And they're reciting the Army values. This is in their first week in basic training. And... Uh, they're, you know, and they, these kids are really hurting trying to get through 
Uh, and uh, they're, they're out there, they're teammates, not told by the drill sergeants. In the first week, that's pretty darn good. That's where it's starting to come. They start to understand it. They start to internalize it. They weren't told, get out there, follow the rules, cheer your teammates on. And uh, General Sullivan, by the way, we're watching this about halfway through. I look at him, he's crying. I mean, he's crying. He was, uh, he was so moved. Uh, it, it was just amazing. And it made us, you know, he said, he said, it just makes me feel really good about our army, about our country. Uh, and, and it is, but that's internalizing. That's those, that, those folks had done a great job uh, in the first week from day one they start. Now imagine as it goes along how that grows. That's, that's not rules-based for that organization. That's, they, they caught it. They understood it. So it's absolutely key. But the problem is we don't have a clearly articulated ethic in the doctrine. It was, I'm not being critical of my predecessor who's now my boss. That'd be a very dumb move to be critical. Uh, <laughs> Say, what were they thinking back then? I would have never made that mistake, but uh, the, uh, so, uh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Fix these mistakes. I tell people all the time, I got in trouble as a battalion commander at the National Training Center. Fred Rudesheim was my OC, as a matter of fact. A bunch of you know Fred. So, uh, we had just done a mission, and the guys did really well. And so, you know, it was one of those where they, you know, two missions before that, they could critique us for three days and not get through it. But this was a good mission. So Fred was up to him, he's like, well, what does doctrine say to do? And it was like silent. He goes, what does doctrine say to do? And finally I said, Fred, I don't, I don't give a shit what doctrine says. I told him to take the initiative, and they did it. He turned beet red. You know, he, like, <laughs> you know, and he took me outside, and he's like, you can't say that. You can't say you don't care about doctrine. So I, I let Fred know. They got back at me. Now I'm in charge of doctrine. <laughs> so uh, now I have to care about what it says and all that good stuff. And, uh, but anyway... Take the initiative, right, right. So I was, I was following doctrine. I didn't even know it. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, and it is how our doctrine has changed, by the way. I, you know, there's no doubt. It used to be very prescriptive. And I was kind of a doctrine rebel my whole career. I didn't want to be prescriptive. I wanted to come up with better ideas. Now our doctrine, it's a foundation. You know, it's the basic plays. I always use the example like a football team. They don't go out there. You know, the, the Chiefs, when they played the Seahawks last week, they didn't go out and huddle and say, okay, let's see, who's going to play center? Who's going to be the quarterback? I mean, obviously, they've worked all that out. They have basic plays. Now, they ad lib from there as there's opportunities, and that's doctrine is the basic set of plays, and then we encourage folks to innovate and come up with better ways, but it's a basic set you have to have, or, you know, that line isn't just going to get up there and stop that uh, defense without, without practicing on that. So part of doctrine, of course, uh, we've got to arti clearly articulate this ethic. And that's a challenge because, you know, you could write 50 pages and you still wouldn't have written enough on an ethic. But that's not going to resonate well. That's not going to get out. It's got to be uh, short, concise, well, well articulated and so forth. And I know you had it in the read ahead and you'll cover it. Okay, next slide. So we did look at there were six requirements uh, that were key. You know, values-based discussions being one of them, values-based decisions, I'm sorry, the decisions that are values-based again and not uh, just the rules they'll talk earlier. Another one is not a rules-based because we, we, won't, we won't follow that. That's just not. Uh, a shared identity is critical. Uh, you know, that ability to, to share the, the, you know, the uh, development and certification of character. That's a big one. Again, something I don't think we've done enough of uh, we we uh, develop character a lot. We don't always capture when we do that. Sometimes it's the, you know, you're working for a tough boss is sometimes where your character gets developed the most. You know, you look at the wrong way to do something. You learn what not to do. You develop a lot of character. But then how do we measure it? How do we capture that when we do develop it, train it? Uh, not just mission command I mentioned earlier, but ethical mission command being critical. You know, be able to follow that, you know, again, uh, particularly today more than ever, when you look at the emphasis where we're, we're going against for folks who have not only don't follow the Geneva Convention, but in many cases you say are almost, you could say are almost barbaric. I mean, uh, look at what we're, so there's a greater challenge on soldiers. And in, in combat you will see when, when the enemy does something that, like you just go, boy, normal people wouldn't do it. It's horrible. They killed innocent women and children. They did this thing that's just horrible. And you'll see soldiers' reactions. They'll, some will be sitting there like this. They want to get revenge. Some are, are huddled together crying, and you, you, know, you get the chaplain with them. You get them together. You talk to them. You can never lower yourself to the enemy's level. Uh, that gets tougher and tougher in the world today because they're trying to make a greater statement 
and get people to be lowered to their level. So the ethical dilemmas must be throughout the training. And we, you can't face that for the first time in combat or in a tough situation. All of a sudden you face this tough dilemma. You want to have trained it, gone through it. Uh, again, that's, that's just key. And then again, uh, countering that rules-based only and, and eliminating the, uh, the friction uh, between the professed ethic and what we actually do. And let me show you an example of that in two, the next slide. In 2011, they did a study. Uh, in fact, uh, the secretary uh, asked for the study, and it was done uh, by then General Casey, the chief of staff, uh, through CAC, General Caslin at the time. And what we profess in blue, that's what we profess, but this study showed if we're not careful, if, if uh, without an articulated ethic, without clearly explaining what happens if it's not embraced, if it's rules-based only, you see on the other side. So, you know, Army values are seen as laws, regulations, policies, SOPs, which are a heck of a lot easier to break. You know, and then uh, I think as you go all the way down, there's some real, you know, when we talk honest mistakes, some people will say, well, that's zero defect. You know, you, it's, it's almost that cynical view of someone uh, who doesn't quite understand and they haven't internalized it and they haven't had the education, training, and experiences that help develop that, then they can be on that not embrace side and that is not the army we want uh, and, uh, and we won't be the best in the world if we're like that. Fortunately, we're more in the blue, but we have to, we have to constantly work it. And I like that last one, uh, army profession. You know, it is uh, soldiers, the whole total army, uh, of, of guard, reserve, and active, and then and army civilians. But you go over to the other side and it says, oh no, it's focused just active duty. Boy, we see that a lot. And I think that's something we all have to work on. I'm really glad CAPE has way more products for the civilian uh, education side. And I know they're out in the hallway, you can see some of them. There's still way more for soldiers, I got it, but we're getting better. And uh, civilian education, thanks to the work of a lot of folks in this room, is really uh, improving. I think that was our biggest challenge uh, across the board, and that has really improved because, uh, you know, uh, again, a lot of folks in here working very hard getting the funding, understanding how do you measure it, how do we, you know, uh, uh, decisions that happened earlier, like moving uh, some of the civilian schooling to Leavenworth, I think helped a lot to get it there, uh, uh, where the intellectual center is, and you have 200 PhDs to leverage, and uh, so that helps a lot. Next slide. So if we look at expectations, uh, they're pretty high. Uh, the expectations, uh, but I think they should be. Uh, this is what we, you know, again, we're not, uh, we're not uh, uh, in a business where we lose money. Uh, we're a profession where lives are at stake. Uh, and without all of us being on board and understanding, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have, have problems. And uh, so we, have, we should have high expectations to seek and discover the truth, decide what is right. And you can see it. I'll give you an example in a minute. When there's someone who understands it, they aren't going to accept someone who isn't adhering to the ethical standards, someone who isn't uh, part, you know, and then again, demonstrating that character, competence and commitment, balanced, improving in it, contributing honorable service, and uh, probably the biggest one, you'll know somebody really gets it when they become a steward of the profession and they don't put up with, they see something. That's not easy. It is not easy. I had a, a general officer working for me, uh, uh, in another job, you know, he came to me and he saw something. Another general officer, a, a friend of his had done that was not uh, ethical behavior. That's not easy. He said, sir, what do I do? And I, I think about it. What do you do? Are you a steward of the profession? You got you to gotta go and you got to go to turn him in. And, you know, he had talked to him and uh, there was no misperception. You got to go turn him in. There's no question about it. But still, it's not easy. So that officer was looking, you know, hey, what do I do? It's, it's not an easy decision, and you, you all know that. You, know, you wouldn't be sitting where you are if you didn't know how difficult that is, et cetera. Okay, next slide. So this is the Army ethic, and it's real hard to read. You have it. You'll talk about it in the breakout session. One of the things we did find that we really welcome, I think it's fantastic you're having this session because we'll get your uh, experience and wisdom in this, which we had some of, but not enough. This will really concentrate. We, we did this, a breakout with the, uh, the general officers and uh, sergeants majors and senior warrant officers in, in the summer. And uh, there weren't a lot of happy to glad changes, but one thing that struck me that was really interesting, General Retired Freddie Franks was with us, uh, and he had the best uh, recommendation of all. We had written this, and it was, it was a good one-page product. It wasn't fantastic. It was pretty good. Uh, and he said, but you're missing the spirit. They're missing the heart of the document. You know, it's all correct, but it's just, it's just not, you're missing something, you know. And uh, 
and, and he was spot on. We were missing the history that we're so proud of, all of us. And uh, so we really worked on that. Uh, and in fact, that led to, uh, in TRADOC, we're working the front door initiative, how to everyone as they come in. We do a very good job at graduations. We do a very good job at the end. But as they come in the institution, as they join, how do we, for a civilian, for a, a soldier, because uh, TRADOC has a, a good number of those folks coming in with basic training, uh, ROTC, OCS, uh, and, and of course all the uh, uh, civilians that joined TRADOC. But you know, this, this is our effort here, but we'll expand to everybody, and we're certainly working uh, with a lot of others to, to make this happen. So you'll go over this. We really welcome, please tear it apart, help us, because what we'll do then, go to the next slide, is uh, the ADP1 and ADRP1 will be revised It'll be ready in June. We'll take your input, take the input we've gotten from the summer, from across the Army, and, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have the one page articulated Army ethic, and of course we'll explain it in a lot more detail in the ADRP, uh, without a doubt. But uh, I think it is important that we have, a again, uh, short, because you may not agree with that. Maybe you think it needs to be longer, but uh, that, that's fine. Give us that input. That'd be terrific. And then there are a bunch of products. I think one of the Again, long before I got here, I think it was my brilliant predecessor that came up with this, was uh, now the, uh, the products in CAPE, uh, the Center for Army Profession and Ethic. Uh, they, we went out and we, we uh, had to put uh, our money where our ideas and our mouths were, and we really contracted and got some really great. I know I have used them at every level. Uh, you know, I was out uh, when I was first corps, and you go out for PT with guys, and you see, okay, they're talking a 10-minute vignette after doing PT. That's success. They're talking about an ethical dilemma, and they're discussing it in the squad, you know, and they're doing it right after doing PT. That's, that's success. That's, these guys, they'll remember that, you know, and you've got it throughout, and there's great little uh, vignettes you could have. A, you know, you don't have to spend a long time preparing. You want to get your folks together. You show a quick clip, and then you talk about it, and then you discuss in small groups. It's very easy to do, which we had been missing in the past. You know, you had to really, to get a quality product before, you had to really research, really I can remember using uh, you know, movies from the past, trying to come up with these things. CAPE has got tremendous award-winning products. They're out in the hall, and anything, if you need anything, let us know. We'll get it to you. And their website has examples of just anything. And then also, as you see there in the, so we have to teach it, educate it, train it in the schools, in, in the units, in the organizations. But then we also, in training, it's got to be a part. Uh, and again, that's, uh, that's everybody. When we're training, we're, we're together as a team be that a combat training center or home station training, uh, and then certainly that will help prepare us for when we do have to go. And again, those moral dilemmas have to be in there. Uh, I found that was the toughest thing uh, today. I, I'm sure it's always been an issue, but even more so today, I believe, is the, the type of enemies we'll face for a long time. A lot of people looking for our weaknesses, uh, and one of those weaknesses, if they can get us to lower to their level, uh, and they'll, they'll use different methods, so we don't, want to, we don't want to get caught in that trap. Next slide. I'm going to use an example. I wish I could put up a tremendous example, but you know how we are. You'll remember this better. Uh, and I think you've talked a little bit. I know I've heard in side conversations, black hearts. And to me, it's a tremendous example. We had Justin Watt come in and talk to us this summer. And I will never forget. Uh, so he was a young man, was in this platoon. Uh, he was not there when they did this. He was not a part of it, but he heard about it. And then he was the only one, uh, well, the first one to come forward uh, on this. So not an easy decision. And he went through a lot. There's his buddies he's been with, but they, he heard of this terrible thing they've done. Now, the people that did these terrible uh, acts are in prison. Uh, they were punished. Uh, and, uh, but Justin Watt, when he was talking to us this last summer, I don't believe it's in this, it's not in this piece, I'm gonna show a video real quick, but they were talking, we didn't capture this uh, well enough, and what, what I'll never forget, of course you can break down any scenario, and there's always a failure of some type, and leadership, whatever, and it's not the finger point, in this case, a really good platoon leader was killed in action, they were a long ways away from comp the company and the battalion, again, dispersed, empowered, the way the world is today, a long ways away, not right there where you can say, what are you doing? Uh, go left, go right. Now, they're a long ways away and it's complicated, and it's only getting more complicated, as we all know. So you could look at the breakdown, but that's not the real lesson. Uh, there was a squad leader that stepped forward as a very dynamic leader 
And I'll never forget what Justin Watt uh, said, and, I, and several other members of the uh, unit have said that. They said he created, the squad leader, created an army that was cooler than the one they were in. Created an army that was cooler than the one they were in. And that's really, so they did not, they had not embraced the ethic and they had not embraced the values. They, those were rules. And they could break the rules because they were in a cooler organization. They knew it was wrong. Uh, as I said, they're in, they're in jail, they're in prison now. Uh, but uh, it was cooler, so they did it. So let's uh, watch this video real quick. Just a minute. I think it's a combination of two things. Like what makes what made me capable of turning in those people when it was difficult or confronting somebody about not meeting the standards or violating the standards, you know, when it was difficult, like what makes me different than the people who knew about it and did nothing? I, I think it's two things. I think one, um, I decided what my left and right limits were. You know what I mean? I knew, I knew who I was. You know, I was maybe a little bit older, you know what I mean, than, than the standard uh, guy in my platoon. But I mean, not a lot. I mean, I was only like 22 years old. Um, I had an identity, you know, that I think, and the, the part of my identity was a value system, right? Um, so there was that. And like, like I was saying before, you know, I had established my left and right limits. Like, this is what I'm willing to do. You know what I mean? Like, this is what I'm not willing to do. If it falls within here, you know what I mean? Like, I could look at that as, this is like the honorable service sector, right? Anything outside of that is, is no longer honorable service, and I'm not willing to do that. So... Uh you know, he says he establishes values. It's a little tough to hear that, you know, and then as you dig in deeper, if we play, you know, we kept going and be talking about he, he understood honorable service and had established that. So he had caught it. He understood it. And others, it was rules and a cooler army was created and they broke them. And, and that's why I think it's really important. Uh, we could look at some of these events that occurred as a profession and say, ah, oh, they were anomalies. You know, and Abu Ghraib, those things just wouldn't happen again. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. You have to look at it and say, okay, what caused this? How do we prevent this in the future? What can we do to prevent it? And guys like Don Snyder help us figure that out. And then, you know, and then establishing the Center for Army Profession and Ethics and having that so it's throughout our profession. Because I could submit, that could be anybody that works for any of us, empowering someone, and they could have found something that for some reason they broke the rules if it wasn't internalized, how do we help them, educate them? And a key part of it is this army ethic, understanding the ethic and getting it across the entire force. So we welcome your comments as you break down into the groups. You'll get guidance on that in a minute. I'll take any questions or discussion. I'll be happy to, we had a really good discussion after this for about 45 minutes. This, uh, this summer on this, but again, you may be uh, after Simon Sinek and lunch and everything, maybe you're like, ah, forget it, I'll ask him later. And that's okay too, if you want to, but anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah. In one of your slides, um, I noticed you had something up there that talked about certifying character. Yeah. How to certification. Yeah. I've never heard of that before. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what, what some of your thoughts are about how do you certify character? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a great question because uh, we go in cycles in this. And uh, we used to, uh, for example, when I was a lieutenant colonel going through a combat training center, we had a uh, leader development model that was with us, and character was one of the areas and we would measure character and we would talk about it. Then we got away from that, we go in cycles. But certifying, what we're looking at is that uh, in, when you come in an organization, there's a process that captures that you do understand character, uh, commitment, and competence. Now the competence we do very well. I will say the, uh, the uh, military does very well the competence. We measure, okay, you've, you know, from a PT test to weapon scores, all that, we're all over that. Uh, but the character and the commitment, uh, not, not so much. So as we're looking at it, uh, we're going to develop tools. We have some already developed. Uh, there's an uh, uh, Army career tracker you're all familiar with, electronically can capture and, and learn, and then electronic job books and other ways we used to. And how do we, in organizations, provide them the tools to certify uh, character, competence, and commitment? And then in our schools, we're looking at, 
we kind of, in some ways, do, but we don't put a little stamp on it, certified. We, we have lots of, in our uh, education and curriculum, we will have ways to ensure they get that class, but we don't necessarily certify. One of the initiatives, one of the things with Army University, as you look at, uh, as, we're, as we're adjusting how we teach, Right now, to do that is very difficult. You have, eight, in Tradoc alone, 86 separate schools that are stovepipes. So if you want to get something done, you go up the stovepipe, over the stovepipe, down the stovepipe. And in the Army University concept, you eliminate those stovepipes. You're still empowering. You're not centralizing. You're empowering folks. But you're enabling to take those ink spots that are really good and spread them across. And one of those is in certification uh, of character and commitment. Now, the challenge in it is it's squishier than competence. That's why we're all over competence. You know, I mean, competence is very easy. You know, you hit the targets or you did not. Character and commitment, there are other ways you demonstrate that, and that's why one of the things we need to do is increase the amount of training we do that and education that we do. And we're starting to see that. I was in a, a class at CGSC uh, about a month ago that was just incredible going over the, the, the Army profession and the ethic, and they, oh my goodness, these really talented majors with so many deployments were all over it. I mean, they, they could still be talking about how we get at that and what they had seen and where it wasn't done right. And so uh, it's a combination of, you know, what you don't want to do is check the block in teaching it. You want it to come in. And so you've got to certify how you're doing that. Uh, the other thing I would say is, uh, depending on the organization, I don't, I don't know for the uh, civilian cohort, I, don't, I haven't seen examples of this, but I do know for the uniform Certain leaders will go through a very uh, certification process they have on their own. How do we spread that across to everybody? Uh, and it gets to, uh, like when I was a young lieutenant, I had a battalion commander would make me read books and write book reports. And, uh, you know, that helped me a ton as part of our certification process in the profession and things you learn. And there was a whole, uh, you know, we talked about examples from Vietnam. I, I, you know, we talked about all kinds of things that would lead to that. So, uh, but we have a long way to go in that. The good news is we're talking about. Add one thing that, that is quite difficult, uh, and is, as Bob said, a lot of the competency uh, metric and certification is um, top down. Yeah. So if you take a look, whether it's out at the NTC or wherever it is, certification is top down. What we're finding from a character point of view is that a lot of that insight sometimes comes from the bottom up. So what we have started is a 360 degree evaluation. Uh, now the General Officer Corps has had that for a while. So, you know, Bob works for me, so I do an OER on him, but he does a 360 on me. Mine is for attribution, his is non-attribution. So I gotta go back, I think I know which one for sure. So. Um, and so what we're doing now in the Army is all battalion and brigade commanders will go through a 360 eval. But with our MSAT that we've had for a while, you get to pick who does it. With this one, you don't. Uh, and so it is your, uh, obviously your peers, your subordinates, and your superiors to conduct a 360, because we're finding that that is one of the better ways to highlight some of these character issues. What we're doing now, we ran a pilot, uh, actually, well, CAC does it uh, with the Mission Command, Center for Army Leadership there. And people focus initially on, well, what questions are you going to ask and how do you do it and all that? And as I would tell the chief and others, sir, respectfully, getting the data is not the hard part. It's what do you do with it once you have it. So if you're doing a 360, what do you do with this data that you have? If you know something about somebody, is it use an OER for uh, selection? If it's non-attribution, how do you kind of quantify it? But we're finding the character piece sometimes is better seen from the bottom than the top. So we are trying to get at this. Uh, not easy, but we are, we are uh, applying a lot of intellectual effort on it. I don't know, Don, any thoughts? Yeah. You know, my reaction to answer your question is that the Army has always done character evaluations. We've just not formalized them. Yeah. You have to make a recommendation as to whether someone is promotable to the next grade. So how do we do character evaluations? It's very simple, we just watch. That's the leader's responsibility, you simply observe. Observed behavior is accurate reflection of personal character in most cases. Sometimes people can fake it for short periods, but human nature is six, we can't fake it for the long period. And so we've been doing this. So if we have good leader-to-led relationships where there's an individual development plan which you're working for in the civilian court, 
If you know what's in that individual development plan, some items in that individual development plan are going to be about the development of their individual character. And we ought to talk about these things. We want holistic human development. We just don't want singular performers. So the development concept of, of the profession always is that you develop the individual holistically. So I'm, I understand, and I've, we've gotten a lot of pushback on this from different sources. It is softer, your word mm -hmm. is correct. It's a little squishier. And some people say, well, you can't measure that. And my response is, well, you've been measuring it at least for the 50 years I've been associated with the Army. Mm -hmm. Because people have been in, making honest, professional evaluations of who gets promoted and who doesn't. Now, maybe those weren't well informed as they will be with 360s, but this is not new. We know how to do this. It is a culture. Oh, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's always easy to just say, yeah, what Don said. And uh, <laughs> that's since I've been working on this. So I'll start off and say, yeah, what Don said. Uh, and, um, but in some ways, interesting you bring that up. Uh, unfortunately, throughout my career, I've had to relieve people. I've only relieved a person once for competency. Every other time, unfortunately, when I relieve somebody, it was for character. And to Don's point, it's actually easier to relieve somebody for character than competency. So that's actually a good news. Not that we're looking to relieve people. And, and actually, the 360, we say it's a developmental tool. The 360 is not a test. We're really trying to use it as a developmental tool and, and things like that. But actually, in our system, as Don said, if, you, if you're looking for the quite honestly, and I'm, I'm not saying design this way, but it is because I think of the importance we put on it. If you have to relieve somebody for their duty, if you relieve them for a character issue, that happens immediately and there's almost no pushback. If it's a competency issue, uh, you know, you, your score versus their score. So I think we're, we're building on a position of strength, quite honestly. I would say also that the, the 360 is a cultural change too. Uh, and we've been talking all the pre-command course, lieutenant colonel, colonel future uh, commanders about it. And, you know, uh, it is because there's, there's some concern. Are you going to use it for evaluation? In some cases, how, you know, the Raiders doing it, how can you not use it? So that's the trick for all of you. You know, how do you get that feedback? But it's accepted as growth. Uh, like all, all assessments overall, we're trying to get up more assessments, identifying strengths and weaknesses so we can use the strengths and fix the weaknesses. But you've got to get people to tell and, and, you know, what those weaknesses are. If they think it's an assessment or, you know, or for uh, evaluation, they're not going to tell you. They're going to hide it, and then you don't get the value out of it. But yes, sir. Okay. Hey, sir, Karen Dramagulero with the Army Corps of Engineers. You know, I think the difficulty is going to be trying to translate that into something that's not perceived as subjective. Yeah. When we're really trying to, I mean, I'm, I'm having trouble with that certified character I think we all recognize, you know, good character or bad character yeah. when we see it. And uh, if we're leaders, we're talking about our folks about that all the time anyway. But getting to the, the certification piece and the describing piece, I think it's going to be a lot more difficult. No, I, I think if we, if, I think we said uh, unrealistic, if we think we can have some point scale, oh, here you are, you're above this, you're certified, you're, you have character. No, it's a variety of feedback forms. And, but uh, there certainly are plenty of examples. And uh, as uh, your great points on observing folks, and you definitely, I've ha I have no problem, anybody that's worked for me, describing their strengths and weaknesses and character. You see them in so many circumstances, so many different ways. Uh, and we can get closer to that than we are. Make it a little less squishy, if you will, I think for sure, uh, no doubt. Well, uh, one more? That's it? We're out? Okay, well, send, if you, if you want, you know, please, if you have a question, you can, when I see in a, one of the meetings in the Pentagon, we're sitting next to each other all the time, uh, or uh, email me, and uh, really appreciate the chance to talk to you again. Thanks for what you do, uh, and uh, really look forward to, uh, but if there's anything, if you have any questions or something you didn't get to ask, I know it happened, send it, send it right to me. I'll either uh, answer it or get the answer or get the CAPE guys, and I would encourage you the, uh, uh, to grab some of their products out there. Cause, uh, and if you see ideas of how we can make them even more relevant for uh, uh, our uh, professional uh, civilian uh, cohort, then let us know. I mean, we want to do that. It's not, we're not, you know, sometimes uh, you know, we're a little bit better at this because we're wearing a uniform, but uh, we, we have help and we'll, we'll work it. So thanks very much.